David Fincher's Zodiac tells the real-life story about the manhunt for a serial killer who terrorized the San Francisco Bay Area from the 1960s and 1970s. Hello, movie friends. Welcome back to Raiders of the Lost Podcast, the ultimate film and TV podcast. And today we're going to be covering a modern classic, and one of the best investigative films of all time, David Fincher's Zodiac. This is an incredible film, and because David Fincher has such an incredible filmography, it's incredible. It, it always gets—I <laughs> feel like it always gets left out of like top three lists because it's hard to pick. I mean, when you have Fight Club, Seven, Social Network on your filmography, it's absurd. <laughs> but then Zodiac, like you could argue, is. One of the best movies of the 21st century. It's got to be in the top 50 in that category, really. And I think it's absolutely incredible and so underrated and not talked about enough and and very overlooked, especially not getting a single nomination at the Academy Awards. Nothing for cinematography, editing, directing, writing. Screenplay? Nothing. Not a single nomination, which is absurd because even the editing of this movie is terrific. It was a first-time editor for doing his first movie. He'd done a couple... Uh, co-editing jobs for Fincher before, but this is his first ever editing deal. But like, but also Fincher helps with the edit too. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. He's such a hands-on filmmaker. But my goodness, what an incredible film on IMDb! Zodiac is a seven point seven. What at five hundred sixty thousand ratings, which I think is seven point seven. Low. Uh, Rotten Tomatoes it has a ninety percent critic score, and then the audience score perfectly mirrors the IMDb score with seventy seven percent score there on a budget of 65 million it grossed 84 million dollars globally but it made up definitely in dvd sales and rentals as as soon as it dropped on dvds it made seven million dollars that weekend so it over time became a very profitable film i suppose that i don't know maybe it's just too slow for most audiences to give it such an average rating as That's a why. seven seven and a half ish um because that really is just like that rating means it's good but i think this movie is absolutely fantastic and it's an excellent piece of filmmaking but i suppose it could be it's too slow maybe there isn't enough zodiac but that was fincher's approach to the film where uh, you can look at actually the trailer as a misleading piece of marketing the trailer i don't know if you've seen it recently not since 2007 <laughs> so i just i just watched it uh, and it's cut like it's like a horror movie and it has like horror movie music to it so they advertise this film as being like a serial killer horror movie where it's couldn't be further from the truth. It's an investigative film. And, uh, I disagree, but continue. Well, well I, wouldn't, I wouldn't call it a horror film. There's moments of horror, but this is an uh, investigative drama, and it's more like the, All the President's Men than it is Seven. You it know definitely I mean? has that same tone as President's Men, yeah, for sure. Yeah, oh, for sure. Whenever I remember, well, whenever I watch this movie, I think of All the President's Men, which is the ultimate journalism movie. Watch it if you've never seen that movie. All the President's Men yeah. is phenomenal. Yeah, it's about the the Nixon, the Nixon story being broken. Watergate. Watergate being broken. <laughs> I don't know why I couldn't the, think of The Nixon, Nixon thing. The like, Nixon pres so, president. Something to do with pools. The Richard Nixon <laughs> article. <laughs> it was like rainy that day. <laughs> but uh, it's definitely not a horror film, although there are some scary moments. I think that uh, uh, Robert in the basement is definitely a horrifying scene, and it's captured perfectly and blocked and shot in a way that it's just creates suspense and thrills and it is very much one of the most frightening scenes of recent memory and a couple of the murders are pretty scary i would i would say the first murder is not very scary but the the lake murder it's not so much scary as it is just disturbing and shocking but i would say the basement scene in my opinion, is really the only scary scene in the film. So that way, I, I can't really call this a horror film. And also, Venture, he could have made it a horror film. He could have taken uh, more the perspective more so of the victims. He could have made those sequences longer. And also, we could have seen more Zodiac. But he chose instead to focus on what I agree is the more fascinating aspect of the entire story, and that is the story. Zodiac, the zeitgeist. Everybody was talking about Zodiac. He was on everybody's minds for a very long time, especially in these areas. And many members of the public and especially members of law enforcement became obsessed with it, with the idea, with who this person was. That's ultimately what Fincher focused on. 
and you can't help but deny that it was the proper way to tell the story. Before we start breaking down Zodiac, the very best way to support our show is to leave us a five-star review right now on Spotify, Apple, iTunes, wherever you're listening to us right now, as well as if you're watching on YouTube, hit that subscribe button. We also have a Q&A and poll on Spotify, so be sure to answer that poll on the Spotify app. And we are doing a very special movie poster giveaway in this episode in order to enter for a chance to win a free poster from MoviePosters.com. All you have to do is make a comment in the YouTube episode of Zodiac. Quick background on Zodiac. The film tells the story of the manhunt for the Zodiac Killer, a serial murderer who terrorized the San Francisco Bay Area during the late 1960s and early 1970s, taunting police with letters, bloodstained clothing, and ciphers mailed to newspapers. The case remains one of the United States' most infamous unsolved crimes. Fincher, Vanderbilt, the screenwriter, and producer Bradley J. Fisher spent 16 months conducting their own investigation and research into the Zodiac murders. Fincher employed the digital Thompson Viper film stream camera to photograph most of the film, while traditional high-speed film cameras used for slow-motion murder sequencers were also involved. So the majority of this film was digital filmmaking, which was still very new back in 2007 and 2006 when this was being made. I believe it was only 2K at the most. At the very most. I think, honestly, it was 1080p. Actually, no, I think it is HD. I think it was 1080p. They mastered it in 2K. Yeah, they mastered it. Exactly. Zodiac was released by Paramount Pictures and, and Warner Brothers Pictures together which was kind of a rare thing you can think of now but this was happening with a lot of indie projects back then and it was released in march 2007 received largely positive reviews with praise for writing directing acting and historical accuracy the film was nominated for several awards including the saturn award for best action adventure or thriller film it grossed 84 billion i mean 84 million (laughs) uh which i already said and in 2016, a critics poll conducted by the BBC said that Zodiac was voted the 12th greatest film of the 21st century. So I think that this movie has aged like fine wine. And also, I would say for a lot of film critics and maybe audience members, this movie really solidified David Fincher as one of the best directors alive working today, for sure. And going to digital cinematography... So Fincher was part of a class of filmmakers who in the 2000s and even in the very early 2000s, they were experimenting with digital cameras. And Danny Boyle is a filmmaker who started experimenting with 28 Days Later. Steven Soderbergh was actually filming on videotape and digital cameras at times, even in the 90s. I, th- I believe in 98 he filmed something with on video. Uh, these three in particular, very respected directors and titans of independent film, I think that a, fin- a film like Fincher's Zodiac solidified the idea that digital cameras are a thing of the future, and if used properly, even in HD, it still looks great on a big screen. For Fincher, it's something where he can have complete control of the filmmaking. He can he likes to see the he likes to see on site what is what the shot is in exact detail on his own screen. And I, there's so many stories about him obviously being very controlling and very precise, but he never had that kind of control with film where he would say he would get the dailies or the rushes back and be like, this is all I have to work with. Or sometimes the DPs would tell him, oh, it's going to look like this, but it's not. It doesn't come out to what he was expecting when they got the dailies back or the footage back. So explain it, dailies for some people because we get questions. Oh, about yeah. That a lot. So dailies are basically the rushes of film that you shot the day previous. So. So you, say you're making a movie and you shoot for an entire day, you send the film off to a lab to get processed, and then you go to sleep, you wake up the next day. Generally, the first thing you'll do is you'll get those dailies in, the the film that was processed that you shot yesterday, and you, the other, the DP, some producers, maybe even some of the cast, you'll go into the small theater or screening room and you'll look through all of the footage to make sure, did we miss this? Uh, How is this shot? Is that out of focus? This is a way to make sure we don't need to shoot anything again that we shot previously. And so the dailies are basically just the the developed film process that was shot the day before. And of course, they have monitors that they're watching on set, but a different quality, different format versus what the film would look like. Exactly. And you can't exactly precisely see digitally what it will look like. It's all basically based on metrics. And so with digital filmmaking, Fincher is getting an actual... 100% 100% realistic uh, representation of what the camera is seeing on his own screen on set. So that's why he prefers that. And I always prefer a film, but with a filmmaker like Fincher, 
he's able to make it look incredible. Uh, and he shoots it in a way that it still has a cinematic quality, whereas some DPs, when they're shooting digital, it still kind of feels like TV. He also edited this film on Final Cut Pro, which is a program that only costs a couple hundred bucks. Anybody can use it, Final Cut Pro. So We're using that in college. Yeah, so <laughs> he showcases that you don't need to have the best gear, the best equipment in the world to really craft a good story. All it comes down to is the story and how talented he is as a director where... He's able to use basically tech and gear that any consumer could purchase and use. But for him, he turns it into something special. And speaking of stories, this is a fascinating one. I mean, I love so many historical or factual films because they're kind of like time capsules that you open up whenever you watch it. And it's like going back into this world and this, this zeitgeist culture of Zodiac and the Zodiac murder who was active through two different decades. And... It's a very personal story to David Fincher because even though I believe he was born in Colorado, he grew up in San Francisco Bay Area and he grew up during the time of the Zodiac murders. So he was actually really interested in doing this film, even though he didn't want to necessarily get put in the box of just being the serial killer filmmaker after making Seven. Uh, but after Panic Room, he took a five year hiatus from filmmaking and this was his next film after that. And so, but in that hiatus, he was developing his experimentation with digital filmmaking and digital productions. He was doing a ton of the biggest commercials every year. He was doing commercials for Nike, for Coca Cola, really pushing the bounds of what you can do digitally with filmmaking for just short form content. And then obviously, this was leading up to his eventual transition to being a, a digital filmmaker with Zodiac, which is the first film that he almost shot entirely digitally. Again, a lot of the slow motion sequences are still shot on film with different cameras. And that's why it kind of has this eerie like fairy tale quality almost like a dream like sequence when he does shift that perspective and change the the format and technical specs of the filmmaking yeah, that's because the digital cameras at that time didn't have anywhere near the frame rate that that special camera could get to I, I think a great example of a shot like that is the slow motion killing of the gunshots in the opening sequence as well as the taxi driver there's a slow motion sequence I believe when that guy gets killed as mm -hmm. well and those are shot in film you can tell it looks a little different but it, it adds so much to the sequence and the story was obviously based off the novel by Robert Graysmith, who is played by Jake Gyllenhaal in the film, who is the essentially the main character of the movie. It's his story. Of course, that means that there's going to be some biases to it. But I think factually, they really stuck to their to the truth of this of this show. I mean, of the story in the movie, because like I said earlier, they did 16 months of their own research. So it's an adaptation of the book in addition to their own research by James Vanderbilt, who the screenplay writer was with David Fincher and producer. And I think the story structure for this movie is absolutely incredible. I mean, it opens up with one of the murders and this whole movie takes place chronologically. We're not doing flashbacks or anything like that. We're not doing memories at all. But it's all a forward progression, multiple perspectives between the victims, between Zodiac, between Robert and Avery, between Robert by himself, between Toski and Armstrong, Toski by himself, Toski and Robert. And I think that the handing the baton off of the control of the narrative is really effective, whether it's between victims and the Zodiac or Robert or Toski going back and forth. It's awesome. I will say, though. It's not quite, you don't ever see Zodiac's perspective per okay, se. Sure, yeah. You see, only see Zodiac through the perspective of the victims. And the way he actually shoots all these sequences are always from the perspective of victims. You never get to see his face. And even if you look at that lake sequence, uh, the reveal of Zodiac, the couple are still in frame and we're behind them. And so it's not like he framed it like a Christopher Nolan shot where we're following behind Zodiac as he approaches them, then that would be Zodiac's perspective. But in every case, even the taxi driver, when the taxi driver gets shot, where's the camera? You're never getting Zodiac's perspective at all, especially with the camera work, which is why I think the film works so much. Obviously, he used this to great effect with Seven by showing the aftermath of the crimes and then eventually revealing John Doe halfway through the film. And then John Doe is you very much follow his perspective much of the film. In this case, not in any moment during the course of this film do you ever feel like you're in the perspective of Zodiac or seeing situations through his side. It's always from the side of the victims, which I think is a strength to all of the scenes. Great point. Now, I'm going to disagree with you about you saying it's not really a horror movie, even though there are scenes that are horror-esque. And of course, I think that he does a great job playing with the tone. And this movie... I was I rewatched it last night and the number one movie that came to my mind besides all the president's men because it's just an investigative film is Jaws. 
this movie reminds me so much of Jaws, <laughs> not just because of the opening attack sequence of our of our killer, of our monster, but it feels like a monster movie at times, with Zodiac being this monster that you can't catch. And also... And especially when Jaws wrote notes to the police yeah, department. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, ripping off, <laughs> ripping off Jaws... <laughs> Of course, like I was watching, like Jaws did this first. Jaws mess- wrote the uh, San Francisco Chronicle, but Jaws, in, the, in terms of the perspective of the tone, the tone shifts. And I mean, think about oh, you talk third act, yeah, the whole the whole film. Yeah, think yeah. about think about the opening sequence of both Jaws and Zodiac. Mm-hmm. Zodiac and Jaws both open up with like a party sequence. It's Fourth of July and Zodiac. It's the beach party and Jaws, and it, the mood is kind of light. And then for Zodiac, it obviously gets a little stranger, but we're on this date. And then the attack. And mm-hmm. then same thing with Jaws. This kind of awkward little, let's go skinny di- skinny dipping and sure. swim naked. Then the attack. It's great they parallel. kind of open really similarly. But what they both do exceptionally well is, I think, obviously hiding your killer. Even though we see the Zodiac, we don't really get great looks at him. And David Fincher had a different actor portray him every time we were in a, one of the murder sequences, which I thought was so clever because it mirrors the conflicting accounts by witnesses in real life and you hear a different voice every time and you see a different body shape every time so you're like you can never even make your own assumption uh, is it uh lee allen i mean lee arthur. arthur lee allen yeah arthur but then it's like wait the guy from the park is much shorter and smaller than uh that actor so there's no way it was him but or was it him i love how I was going to ask you if you looked into that because yeah. it seems like every time it was a different person portraying yes. him. And that puts you in the shoes of not just the the victims because we're getting different accounts from different people, but also the investigators were like, oh, well, this person said that they were over six feet tall, but this person said that they were five foot eight, something like that, or they had a round face, they had a crew cut, but he's got bald hair, he's got bald head. But also, going back to Jaws, what I think they compare so well with is the tone. And the music is super helpful and also the passage of time. Now, Jaws and Zodiac both have moments of intense horror and shock and terrifying sequences and scenes. Different lighting. Sometimes we're at night, sometimes it's broad daylight. But then also ha- they both have intense moments of brevity and joy and fun and humor. And think about John Williams' score. Like when they're on the orca and they're, f- and they're chasing the shark, John Williams' music is like so uplifting and like exciting. We're, we're like on an adventure, but then it gets really dark in horror sequences mm-hmm. when the shark's attacking or, or it's dark out and, and he starts bashing into the walls. Same thing with Zodiac. So many moments of fun investigating passage of time. We have different rock, we have different music from different eras to bring energy and lightness to the film. As Great well soundtrack. As, yeah, awesome soundtrack, which goes, which adds to the time, the passing of time, which we'll get into in a little bit, but keeping moments upbeat and uplifting and fun, but then in Intense moments of darkness and terror and dread. So I think that Jaws and Zodiac actually compare really well. But I would say the the biggest difference is there's never any kind of sequence of someone being hunted, really. Um, whereas Jaws has multiple sequences of attacks, which are extremely suspenseful and horrific to witness. Uh, whether it be someone being chased or trying to swim away or even getting the shots under the water, POV of the shark. So I would still disagree that it's missing those propulsive moments of terror. But true true terror. The whole movie is about a hunt. Yeah. It is a hunt? It is, yeah. You're right. There is a hunt. Yeah, but I'm talking about point A to point B no, in, no, in a matter of seconds. But, I yeah. mean, it's a quicker no, movie. Yeah, this movie takes place yeah. over 20 years. Yeah, but I would just, I mean, I just can't see this as a horror film. I look at it as, I look at it as a, a police investigative drama more than anything. So I'm not saying it's a horror movie, but yeah. I'm saying it's a monster movie. It is, yeah, monster, yeah, Zodiac, it, it, it is a, he is a metaphorical monster in a way. Absolutely, because it's, he's the real life boogeyman. He yeah. never got caught, even though Arthur Lee Allen is probably was probably the Zodiac. They never got to officially interview him. He had a heart attack before he came in for questioning and to be identified by that victim from his youth as he was older. But also, he, there was a DNA t- test done that they showed at the end of the film that excluded him and said that r- ruled him out, basically. Yeah. So even though all this evidence points directly at him, it's, it's all circumstantial. Open case. It's yeah. still an open case. I wonder if someone's still working it. <laughs> I guarantee. I mean, the thing with the internet is people are so obsessed, especially with DNA technology advancements and, and public records. People are opening, uh, closing cold cases at, like never before. Do you think Arthur Lee Allen was the Zodiac personally? Absolutely. I think it is without a doubt. However, almost all of the evidence is circumstantial. It's unprovable in a court of law, especially because he couldn't be identified because he died before he was brought in. 
Yeah, he couldn't be questioned after that identification. I would say, man, I think... No, he wasn't even identified yeah, in yeah. person. It was just yeah. a photo. Yeah, yeah. I would say it's possible, but I do think that the complete lack of physical evidence and also a lot of evidence discrediting him as the Zodiac made it seem like it really, even though he was a favorite su- suspect and fit in a lot of places where the investigators wanted him to fit and check a bunch of the boxes, again, I think it was just, it wasn't enough to really make me feel like this guy was the killer. Um, but there was obviously so much suspicion, and there was another suspect, another another big suspect, but the film chose not to pursue that story at all because I think Arthur Lee Allen was a, such a fascinating take on a possible suspect as being Zodiac, and so much of what is showcased in the film, and I'm sure in Gray Smith's book, is it seems to be like so definitive, and it makes you so certain, but then... Once you get the actual hard evidence, it's everything says no, 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 it's not him. And that's what's so interesting, I think, about the film and the character. And it's portrayed perfectly by uh, John Carroll Lynch. He's a great actor. You've seen him in a bunch of things. And he portrays uh, Arthur Lee Allen really subtly of someone who seems odd, behaves a little strangely, seems to have a little too much control of himself, and... There's just something not right about him, but that doesn't mean he's a serial killer. You know what I mean? And one of my my favorite scene in the film is the fir- the interview of him, where uh, a few of the cops go to interview him at his place of work, and the way that Fincher shoots it is really brilliant because he does pretty standard setups, and he starts with a, a, a wide with the, the whole group with Carol Lynch in in the foreground. And then as the conversation is getting a little bit more intense, we're getting a lot of individual shots. But then when things get very uh, suspenseful, what happens is Fincher, he goes from pretty standard shots to he, he goes to centering each actor and having them look into the lens, into the frame, directly into the camera, kind of breaking the fourth wall. And he does a, he does a cut to each actor. And it's the only time he uses this setup. For this this 10 second moment where he goes from actor to actor to actor, they all get their own individual shot looking directly into camera. And that puts you on edge. And you can feel what those characters are feeling in the moment. And that's a perfect way of illustrating like the fear that Arthur Lee Allen is putting onto the other characters. And that's just such a brilliant piece of filmmaking. And this cast is absurdly good. We have Jake Gyllenhaal in the lead role as Robert Graysmith, really bringing that that Boy Scout charm to it and innocent quality. Robert Downey Jr. plays Paul Avery, who was a rock star reporter in the 1960s, but we slowly see the deterioration of his character. And we see the deterioration of a lot of characters as their obsession with the Zodiac and entire lives revolving around the Zodiac killer go empty. Their answers, their questions go empty for their entire lives and their lives just kind of just go off the deep end and they lose their families and everything. Well, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt, but just, just real quick, Ray Smith... Avery, Armstrong, they all become obsessed and it affects them so negatively where Armstrong quits the force. Avery has... Well, he, just, he transfers. Transfers. Oh, I thought... I'm sorry. I thought he retired. No, he transferred to a fraud. Avery becomes a drunken, belligerent drug user and living on a boat. And I then, live uh, on a boat, Robert. <laughs> Toski nearly loses his family, but makes a major change in his life to put his family start putting his family first but you can tell he almost lost his family and then gray smith loses everything because of his obsession yeah he loses his family although yeah. at the end of the film we learn that he still has a great relationship, a healthy, with, relationship. healthy relationship with his kids <laughs> mark ruffalo is as inspector david toski was an excellent casting as well and the really interesting th- thing about our three top build downey jake and ruffalo is they don't appear on screen in the three of them together which I think is a great strength to the film because it's something like you want to see but never happens. Then we have Brian Cox. What, is this, is it not at all? The not, three of them in camera together does not happen. Okay, but they they are in scenes together. Well, obviously because Jake yeah. had... I mean, Rob, Robert and Paul have a relationship, then Robert and Toski have a relationship. Yeah, but yeah, because Toski come, when Toski comes into the newspaper uh, a couple of times, they're in the same setting. You oh, know? actually, yeah, I they am wrong. Are, they, they are in a shot together, I think. Goodness, I'm wrong. Downey and... Downey They're and, and Gyllenhaal are in the foreground. It's as, when as when Avery a, gets yeah. It's when Avery gets his letter, the Halloween card. Yeah, they're yeah, they're all. In the I believe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think. Okay, so I'm wrong. It's okay, Damn, man. I, I thought I. 
That's why there's two of us. That's man. why there's two of us. Because <laughs> someone would have been listening. Oh, what an idiot! <laughs> <laughs> Ryan Cox is an absolute scene stealer. He as... actually doesn't even appear appear on screen. <laughs> Brian Cox is an absolute scene stealer as Melvin Belly, who's basically like this prophetic TV show host who is just a great character. Again, Anthony said John Carroll Lynch is Arthur Lee Allen. Richmond Arquette and Bob Stevenson, John Lacey, all play different versions of Zodiac as well as a couple other actors. And then Chloe Sevigny, who is just was like an indie queen at the time, still is. She plays Melanie Roberts. Oh, I'm wife. sorry. Did you say John Carroll Lynch played a version of Zodiac or no? No, I, no. N- okay. Well, no. Then I said, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm, he didn't. I, we, you know, it's, un, it's unverified, but I think there's one sequence that sounds so much like him. Uh-huh. Maybe, an maybe act- they, have, maybe they dubbed his voice. There, there's one. I yeah. think the one where I believe he is in the car with the woman sounds so much like him. I think it's that one. I think. I think Bob Stevenson, he's the, the dildo guy at the airport in Fight Club. He's been in a bunch of Fincher movies. I think that he's the cab killer. The dildo guy in Fight Club. Yeah, at the airport. Oh! Yeah, so that guy, he's actually been in a bunch of Fincher Dil- movies. The dildo guy from Fight Club? Hold on. At the airport, the the airport clerk. I can't say. It's oh, usually... who's, he's in this movie? Yeah, he's in almost every Fincher movie. Oh, he's, he's, he's the boss at Fight Club. Exactly. He's in Fight Club. Yeah. <laughs> Well, no, no, the same no, guy? no, no, no. He's just he's the airport clerk in Fight Club. Okay, but yeah. who's he in this movie? He's one of the Zodiacs. So I think I, from what I from watching it, I think he was the Zodiac who, oh, who killed the cab driver. Gotcha. I, I think they put him there because he has a similar similarly round face. And watching it again, and you he, the way Fincher lit it, you just catch like his light. His face is mostly in darkness. In shadow, sitting in the cab, but you catch just the bottom of his chin and shape of his jaw. And looking at the cast list, I was like, you know, I think that was Bob Stevenson, that actor. But that guy's been in a bunch of Fincher movies. Yeah, I got you. And also, I mean, the the boss from Fight Club is in this yes, movie. Yeah. He plays the DOJ yeah. guy, Department of Justice. And again, but this cast He's is not the boss of Fight Club. The boss. His Every, boss, yeah, no, narrator's boss. Yeah, yeah. yeah narrator's you boss. May, I'm sorry, the way you're wording it is like there's a boss of the Fight Club. The, is the way you're I wording say, it. I thought I said boss in Fight Club. No, you keep saying the boss of Fight Club. The boss in Fight Club. So the bo- narrator's boss. The corporate yeah, boss yeah. who brings the photocopies. Did, did you did you make this? Anyways, <laughs> the cast is awesome. <laughs> Everyone does a terrific job. And I think that, you know, this is Paul, Paul Avery. I mean, Robert Downey Jr., a big coming out party for him because... No one really wanted to hire him after he got out of prison. Shane Black took a chance on him with Kiss Kiss Bang Bang and David Fincher with Zodiac. And then the next year after this, he's Iron Man. So I think this was really a huge role for him to get back into the public's court of opinion of being a great actor and just a charming personality in any film. This has to be the movie because he Iron Man came out in 09. This film came out in 07. So you can't deny he probably got cast in Iron Man in 08. After I thought Iron Man was 08. It came out in 09. Oh, it did. Yeah. You're right. So he definitely got, he had to have gotten Iron Man or at least the. the no, 2008, the sh- bro. Iron Man was 2008. Yeah, man. No. What, oh, did it come out after The Dark Knight or before? I believe. Well, let's see what, when it came was out. Was it May? Yeah, it came out before Dark Knight, didn't it? May 2nd. Yeah. Oh, my God. So, I mean, yeah, whatever. So, <laughs> still top three. my M- theory. Still oh, top three MCU movie, by the way. I think it's, it's the best MCU movie, I would say. But so. Oftentimes, filmmakers and studios, they'll get early access to films, especially if they don't know they know a filmmaker or they're like, hey, we're looking for looking into this actor's work. So they'll get the early screenings of films to be able to see like, oh, is Downey, how's he doing as, as an actor nowadays? So I'm sure that I'm sure Favreau showed this to Disney, to Marvel and we're like, this guy can hold the scene again. You know what I mean? And the kiss, kiss, bang, bang. But I think this was a- well. Marvel. He had to do a bunch of test shoots yes. with him as Tony Stark to oh, really yeah, get obviously. the approval. But to get in the door to be like, I'm, this is my guy. I mean, you're in a David Fincher movie, well respected, well received film, and he's he's doing he does a terrific job in this film. He's almost got the Iron Man goatee, which is funny. But you can see how strong of a performer he is, even when he's opposite Ruffalo and Gyllenhaal. Uh, in my opinion, he's still the best actor on screen. I think he's the ultimate set piece in this movie too. Yeah. Because so much of the filmmaking, so many filmmakers, the way they film stars and, and their big actors is is totally different than what David Fincher will do. And one of my favorite shots in this entire movie is, or multiple shots, are, are Paul Avery's introductions. 
the first time we see Robert Downey Jr. on camera, he is in the background yeah. at a desk 20 feet away from Robert Graysmith, from Jake Gyllenhaal. And the first time we really see him speaking lines is in the, inside the conference room at the daily, you know, editorial meeting. E- editorial meeting, yeah. And so Yeah, it's called editorial. And I, I love the way Fincher shoots this because it's Robert Downey Jr. Everyone knows who this guy is. His opening shot of the scene is he, he doesn't move the camera, and we're looking at the profile of the editor. Avery's back is to us. He's like pouring coffee or like grabbing a snack or something. He says something funny and witty, comes around the desk. He goes off camera, and then he goes and sits down. Fincher hasn't cut the camera at all, and now we're seeing the back of Robert Downey Jr. in the back of his head while he's talking, and then a woman walks to the door to give them the letter. So, like, this entire opening sequence is... And then we cut to the reverse. It's just great filmmaking because I love how Fincher doesn't give a fuck. He's like, I I don't care if I show the back of Robert Downey Jr., but how many filmmakers would never want to show the back of the head of one of their biggest actors and characters like the way Fincher does in this movie? Yeah, the Fincher... He always, the way he frames his shots and sets and blocks his scenes is it's whatever works best for the story. And some actors aren't fans of it. Downey actually wasn't a fan of digital the digital filmmaking. One of our most viral clips on TikTok was the mason jar story where Downey started peeing in mason jars as a way to rebel against Fincher's use of digital filmmaking because they didn't have to change magazines uh, a process which usually gave someone like Downey, you know, five minutes to take a smoke break to get his senses right. Instead, Fincher is, we're just doing takes until I feel happy, and we're not going to stop until I feel like we got it. And there's a great Hall quote where I, I, there's a whole Hall fincher problem uh, relationship. Working really? On I had film. no idea. So I actually have some research. So first of all, they since made up, but while making this film, they did not get along. And there was a point where Hall actually apologized to him for how he was behaving. So Hall was frustrated by the director's methods and commented in an interview, you get a take, you get five takes, then 10 takes, sometimes 90 takes. But there is a stopping point and there has to be a point at which you go, okay, that's what we have to work with. Let's move on. But when we would shoot things, there would come a point where I would say, well, what do I do now? Where's the risk in the performance? Downey on his side said, aside from several times I wanted to get, generate him, I want. I also want to give him what he wanted. I think I'm a perfect person to work for Fincher because I understand gulags, <laughs> 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 which is hilarious. And then Ruffalo, <laughs> Ruffalo said, defending Fincher, saying, the way I see it is you enter into someone else's world as an actor. You can put your expectations aside and that have an experience that's new and pushes and changes you, or you could hold on to what you think it should be and how you think it should be and be stubborn about it. That's an unmovable journey that's filled with disappointment and anger. Now, to get into the the kind of battling between Fincher and Gyllenhaal, there's a, there's a great Fincher quote. I couldn't find it online to get the exact verbatim quote, but I've seen it a couple of times on YouTube of him. He was doing a, a, an interview in, in front of one of his films in, in a theater, and it, it was filmed. So he basically said... Because there's always this idea that, you know, movie stars, let's get them, let's get them off set as soon as possible. We don't want them to work too long. You know, it's like it's it's George Clooney, it's Robert De Niro, it's it's Julia Roberts. Like, it's, we we can't have them here all day. You know what I mean? And so his th- this there's this quote. It's not verbatim, but I'm just from my memory, the way he worded it was. So we have a two million dollar set, a hundred crew members, and we flew cast in from all around the world. And the idea is to get them out of there as quickly as possible. <laughs> Especially the actors who make the most money. Exactly. <laughs> and so Fincher and Gyllenhaal had a very hard time working together. Gyllenhaal said that he, Fincher paints with people and it can be tough to just be a color. You know what I mean? To just be part of the painting, just a color, a color that he's flourishing with. The actor was alluding to tensions that arose from Fincher's demanding directing style, which saw Gyllenhaal perform up to 70 takes of certain scenes. Now, when people say 70 takes of a scene, it's not just one shot. You know, this is talking about all the different camera setups. It's not just 70 takes of the close-up. I think it gets a little blown out of proportion. They are doing several setups, so that helps add into that. You know what I mean? It's and sometimes not- a take is just like a portion of the dialogue. Exactly. And so in an, in an interview with the Times he uh, during the release of Mank, Fincher got honest about the tension that happened with Hall. So this was an interview that came out a couple of years ago. This is what Fincher said. Jake was in the unenviable position of being very young and having a lot of people vying for his attention while working for someone who does not allow you to take a day off. I believe that you have to have everything out of your peripheral vision. 
Jake's philosophy was informed by, look, he'd made a bunch of movies even as a child, but I don't think he'd ever been asked to concentrate on minutia, and I think that he was very distracted. He also said that Zodiac started filming as Jake Gyllenhaal's war movie Jarhead was opening, thrusting the actor into a war season blitz. He had a lot of people whispering that Jarhead was going to be this massive movie and put him in another league. And every weekend, he was being pulled to go off to the Santa Barbara Film Festival, and then the Palm Springs Film Festival, and then the Catalina Island Film Festival. And so when he'd show up for work on Monday, he was very scatterbrained. His managers and his agents would show up, go into his... I'm sorry, go into his trailer at lunch and talk to him about the, being on the cover of GQ in the next photo shoot. And then he was being nibbed to death by ducks and not particularly smart ducks. They got in his vision, and it was hard for him to concentrate and hit the fastball during the movie. Fincher also noted that tensions with Gyllenhaal mostly died down by the end of production and that Gyllenhaal even apologized. The director admitted that there are definitely times when I can be confrontational if I see someone slacking. But also, people go through rough patches all the time. I do, so I try to be compassionate about it. But it's $400,000 a day, and we might not get a chance to come back to the set and do it again. So I tell actors all the time, I'm not going to cut around your hangover. I'm not going to cut around your dog dying. I'm not going to cut around the fact that you just fired your agent or your agent just fired you. Once you get here, the only thing I care about is did we tell the story? Wow, that's really, I had no idea about any of that. It just sounds like Jake, he was probably 26 at the time when he filmed this. And, you know, he's a child star, young actor, and, and huge in Hollywood. And it sounds like I didn't realize that. You know, probably his press and PR teams and management teams were just hurling him all over the place on the weekends. He's probably yeah. exhausted. Then he has to get to a Fincher set. Tired. He's been traveling all weekend. So you're being told you're going to win an Oscar. You're going to be on the cover of, of Time Magazine. So yeah. I, I actually, that's great perspective to get from David Fincher that, you know, Jake was just probably getting bad PR advice and, and just, you know, being worked to death. And he was... And not by Fincher, but by yeah. his team. He and, had no rest. Yeah, in a way, but not just that, but also he was being told that this is more important than focusing on your job right yeah. now. And then Jill Hall, years later, he said that he re he uh, felt bad because he didn't understand that all Fincher wanted from him was to get the best out of him. But he was not allowing himself to do that. I bet this movie changed him as an actor and made him a better actor because of it. I think so, too. I'm sure. Yeah. Because he's he's still really terrific in this movie, and I think it's a great Jake Gyllenhaal performance. I, I actually think he's better in Donnie Darko personally, and, and he's he's just grown. Into oh such yeah, I mean, I wouldn't even actor. I like, wouldn't even put this in top five Gyllenhaal yeah, I mean, performances. Like, talking about Nightcrawler, yeah. he's so exceptional in that. But maybe he he doesn't wouldn't become the actor he was in Nightcrawler if it wasn't for this experience with David Fincher. And mm -hmm. But I guess maybe put things into perspective of when he's on a, a movie set like to this. To commit to it, because that's actually a great point. Because An enemy, that great performance. In a way, he's become not so much a method actor, but he has gone to this point of committing very much so to his roles. And I think that in the early stages of his career, he might not have been like that. Maybe he could have gone towards that early Ben Affleck career where it's like you're the pop actor. Like yes. You're just in big poppy blockbusters. Yeah, so I think that... I totally agree. I think that this experience maybe not changed him immediately, but then probably the years preceding this film, following this film, he was like, you know what? I need to change my approach to acting, and when I'm on a project, I am committing to that completely wholeheartedly. And you know what else I want to commit to right now? Is heading into <laughs> our intermission. So Great we're, we're going to go into our intermission, take a break, because there's still so much to talk about with Zodiac. And I want to start talking about the story and the structure and, and, and the screenplay. That's a great idea. There's so much to dive into. I love this movie so, so much. But before we continue, the best way to support Raiders of the Lost Podcast, besides leaving us a five-star review on Apple or Spotify and subscribing on YouTube, of course, is also becoming a Patreon at pa a patron at patreon.com slash Raiders of the Lost Podcast. It's the best way to support our show. It helps us do the show full-time and make all this ridiculous amount of content for you every week. We have five different tiers, $2, $5, $10, $25, and $100. Every single tier gets access to two bonus episodes every week. You get the weekly chat, which is exclusively on Patreon, still every single Wednesday, but only patrons can listen to it and watch it. And then also you get a weekly bonus episode of the show. That $10 tier gets you access to our Discord. It's an incredible community that we've built with our patrons. And then the $25 tier, you get your own custom episode, which is pretty terrific stuff right there. Oh, yeah. That $100 tier, that is like the, the big daddy, the chosen one tier. You get to come on the show after three months, get your own private watch party. It is the works. It is 
Michael Scott on Pretzel Day. It's the deluxe. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much to all of our patrons around the world. You really keep the lights on for the show every day and help Anthony get his Trader Joe's. I need it. <laughs> Another thing that helps me get my Trader Joe's is, of course, our friends at MoviePosters.com, the number one place to get your posters online today. Head on over to MoviePosters.com and use our special promo code Raiders10 to get 10% off your order today. We are also doing a very special movie poster giveaway in this episode. In order to enter this contest, all you have to do is comment on the Zodiac episode on YouTube that will enter you into the contest to win a free movie from MoviePosters.com. Free movie? A free poster <laughs> from MoviePosters.com. <laughs> they got movies over there? <laughs> <laughs> They're just giving them away. <laughs> giving them away. So enter that contest. We're going to pick a winner in one week. And if you don't win, be sure to use MoviePosters.com for all of your poster needs with our promo code Raiders10. All right, let's head into our intermission, Anthony. Let's do it, man. Begin with the movie quote competition. You ready? Ready. I've been to a million auditions, and the same thing happens every time, where I get interrupted because someone wants to get a sandwich, or I'm crying, and they start laughing, or there's people sitting in the waiting room, and they're, and they're like me, but prettier and better at the, because I'm not good enough. La La Land. Yes, sir. Emma Stone. All Mia, right. Mia. <laughs> With the world so set on tearing itself apart, it don't seem like such a bad thing to me to want to put a little bit of it back together. It don't seem like a bad thing to me. (laughs) I don't know. Hacksaw Ridge. (laughs) See, you need to put that southern accent on. Maybe I would have figured it out. I don't think so. (laughs) (laughs) I love that movie. Not enough, apparently. Speaking of actors who do like the really like like good natured boy quality, like Andrew Garfield had that for so long too, and that's a great example because they both had it. Him and Jake, like the 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 boyish quality until like. They're, they've kind of aged out of it now. Yeah, yeah, because he was playing Peter Parker, and he was like 30, yeah. and he pulled it off. All right, guess, point. guess this movie release year. The Good Girl, starring Jennifer, Jennifer Aniston in Gyllenhaal. Jakey Gyllenhaal. Yeah, uh, 2002. Nice, he got it. Oh, yeah. Got it. I know my stuff. Jealous of Jake. He was making out at, with Aniston in 2002. <laughs> <laughs> Woo. Peak Aniston. Woo. <laughs> <laughs> Groundhog Day. What year did it come out? Ooh, that's a good one. What? 1988. 93. Damn it. So, yeah, you were way off. Felt off. (laughs) Movie pop quiz time, which is relevant to this episode, actually. So... Like I said earlier in the episode, David Fincher grew up in the San Francisco area as a kid while the Zodiac was active in sending his letters to newspapers in the San Francisco Chronicle. Now, as a kid in this neighborhood he grew up in, he had a neighbor who also became an incredibly successful and famous director. They grew up together. Who was it? So they grew up in the same time or just in the same neighborhood? Same neighborhood. George Lucas grew up in his neighborhood. Yes, sir. They're neighbors. Yep. Him and George Lucas. That's how he got the job at ILM. Should have known. I think you. I don't know about sure. Fincher. Well, well, it's also not just <laughs> for you, man. It's like for everyone listening <laughs> to enjoy the questions. No, no, yeah, it was a good quiz question. Yeah, it was a it's qu- a great fact. I, I was, yeah, I figured you'd get it. <laughs> I was like, I was like, I set that up so well that in my head, I'm like, you're just going to get it right away. <laughs> I'm like, all right, well, speaking of earlier in this episode. You're not going to get this. Let me uh, add even more context. The fact that you think I wouldn't know everything about David Fincher is silly. All right. <laughs> okay. I got some, I got a quick question. I got to do mine. What is the name of Sam Worthington's character in the Clash of the Titans? What god, what Greek god does he play? Greek god is he? So he's the son of Zeus. Mm-hmm. Does that make him the nephew of Hades? I wonder. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, something with a P. Yes. I haven't seen this movie like since it came Just, out. Just like think Greek god. What would the name be if it starts with a P? I mean Prometheus. No. Um. um so close. I'm going to get so pissed off when I don't get this. <laughs> what year did this come out? Like around the same time, right? 2010, the first one. Right after Avatar. Mm-hmm. Just give up. I'm going to no, tell man. you. I'm going to tell you. Pegasus. <laughs> Perseus. Perseus! 
You bitch! <laughs> God, you bitch! I knew there was an us in it. I knew it started with P and it ended with us. <laughs> P.S. Percy, Percy is. His name is Puss. He plays Percy. <laughs> Good old Puss over there. Great God, Puss. Just always leaking out of faces and stuff. <laughs> warts. No wonder why the that Greek film didn't work. The Great God of Warts. No wonder why that franchise didn't work. All right, do we have any um, haters or unsubscribes this week? Oh, yeah. We got we got one unsubscribe. Because I did a, we just filmed the other day, so I did all of them in that. Do we get any real haters? I feel like we had some in Oh, in we summer. got a, Yeah, hold on. So Daniel Sanchez wrote... The boys not sharing a hotel bed in Houston? Unsubscribed. <laughs> we got our own hotel rooms. Yeah, because you, you filmed a, a story of your hotel room. Oh, yeah. And it was one bed. We're we so got like, like 20 DMs like, you guys sharing that bed? <laughs> <laughs> the boys sharing a bed just like being kids. It was only a twin size bed. <laughs> just kidding. No, we got our own rooms. Yeah, we got put up in our own spots. We got a ton of hate in um, my Truman Show clip. And then also, obviously, in my Nolan clip. Uh, you got a shit ton of hate in your Dune clip. But yeah. you got a ton of Harkonnen hate. Uh, Harkonnen but, hate for what? For how you were talking about the Harkonnens. Oh, in terms of... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Just calling you an idiot and stuff. The Dune purists. Yeah, Dune purists. That they don't probably, like the design yeah. of Denis Villeneuve's Harkonnen Un- characters. Unreal. But there was it's one... It's not accurate to the book. Bro, it's a new adaptation. But there was one... There was one comment that it was just so... It was so wrong that I had to highlight it. Like, incorrect? Yeah. Because the thing with... The thing with TikTok is, and social media is when you go viral, so for the most part, everyone's great, but when you go viral, you get you get all the bad eggs. and That's when you know you're on the For You page. Yeah, you get not only the hater, the hateful people, but you get the people who are just completely wrong and have absolutely no knowledge about a subject, but act and think that they know everything about it. And so here's an example. I did the, I, I made a TikTok clip about describing the difference between IMAX film and other films. And um, like film re- film yeah. celluloid. Yeah, yeah. And so I'm not gonna say this person's username, but their comment on this was they no longer shoot on film stock. <laughs> Seriously, that's their comment. That's their comment. So I, I I just responded, you couldn't be more wrong. A lot of filmmakers still shoot on yeah. film, but like, again, people it'd be shock, yeah. it'd shock people. This person thinks that film stock is no longer used. Is like it's it's a ridiculous thing to, to even say. And I was just like, that's like saying that musicians don't use guitars anymore. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Some people use a computer. A lot of people still use guitars. Yeah. My God. I was like, that's the dumbest thing I ever heard. That is one of the dumbest things I've ever heard for sure. And the people just think they know things, but they have nothing. They have no idea anything about the subject. Well, everyone's got to be right on the internet. Man. Everyone's right. Yeah. Everyone's correct. Yeah. Except for the, the people who make the video. But that's yeah, pretty wild, man. That was, that was a pretty blatantly ridiculous one I had to highlight. <laughs> that's that's <was> absurd. <laughs> All right. They no longer, they don't even shoot on cameras anymore. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's like, what the fuck are you talking about? All right. Uh, is that all you got for haters yeah. and unsubscribes? Let me check yeah. if we have any new five star reviews on Apple Podcasts let's, that let's I can see. read out. We'll see. We'll see. No new written ones, but we are up to 1,674 ratings and also 1,700 ratings on Spotify. It'd be amazing if we get those numbers up to 2,000 each. Yeah, that would be huge. That too. You don't have to leave like a written review, but if you can go on Spotify and Apple Podcasts and just hit the five stars, that would be amazing. Oh, yeah. Big time. But big how about time. now our stream recommendations? What's yours? For me, because Old Boy is coming out. Actually, I didn't even mean to do this, but Old Boy is getting released in theaters, re release. I'm so excited about it in August. So, August 16th, it's being distributed by Neon. Cannot wait. Park Chen Wook's brilliant masterpiece. He has this is part of a revenge trilogy. So, the first film of the trilogy is called Sympathy for Mr. Vengeance, which I watched for the first time uh, last night. And it was mind blowing and incredible and just as fucked up as Old Boy. And I, I just love him as a filmmaker. I've been meaning to watch this one. And then Old Boy's the middle film. And then the third film in his revenge trilogy is uh, Lady Vengeance. Uh, right? That's what it's called? Sympathy for Lady Sympathy Vengeance. Sympathy for Lady yeah. Vengeance, which I'm going to watch next. And my goodness, Sympathy for, for Mr. Vengeance was terrific. It's on Criterion right now. And we oh, yeah. can't recommend this platform enough. We talk about it a lot. But it's I think it's the best streamer because they have the best movies. But um, Criterion Collection, they have their own streaming platform. So it's Criterion Channel is the platform. Gotcha. And then Criterion Collection is just like what they're called. Yeah. So highly recommend it. But if not, you can yeah. rent it or you know one of those use one of those movie websites that y'all know about. <laughs> I mean, I also have a Criterion Channel uh, recommendation. The Elephant Man, David Lynch's film starring John Hurt and Anthony Hopkins is 
Uh, remarkable film. It's one of the most heartbreaking, tragic movies I've ever seen. I, w- I cried like six times. But man, I, 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 I was just totally floored by it. Uh, Criterion Channel, it's only um, 12 bucks a month. It's cheaper than Netflix, and it's way better. Like I actually canceled my Netflix because I realized I've only watched like three things on Netflix this year. <laughs> I, I've only watched... And I watch Criterion every week. The only time I've used Netflix in the last couple months was to download movies on my phone when I went on a flight. Other than that, I haven't really watched anything on Netflix in so long. Did you even watch the movies? Yeah, I watched The Birds. Nice. And something else. The Birds. But, man, I'm, I just don't use Netflix anymore. Me either, man. They just Because they lost so much of their swag. You know, they lost a lot of, of, a lot of their entertainment because the stri- other streamers got so big in their licensing deals. They right don't now. got no Riz, man. They don't got... Yeah. <laughs> Netflix's Riz has just been plummeting down. <laughs> but, um, all right, let's get back into our episode on the incredible film Zodiac. And you brought up earlier in the, in the beginning of this episode that it's a slow movie, but it's so fascinating that it keeps you enthralled and it's very suspenseful. It's very realistic because of the proceedings, the investigation, like we always say with Fincher films, like no one else films investigation more ex- in exciting ways than him. And I love how he does just the close-ups of paperwork and folders and, and just fun montages as well as there's an incredible montage in the second half of the film where it's a intense passage of time. And I want to talk about the passages of time in this film and how he sh- does it in the transitions where we're getting a lot of floating text and maps and documentation and, and letters and stuff of the investigation parts of the montage that we're watching happen to the characters, which is really cool with great and terrific music. And I think that it's a really effective way to do a different sequence and montage of investigation that isn't just a bunch of close-ups of folders and papers, which he does the first time he does an investigation montage in this film. And it just adds so much energy to the film. I think it's such one of the greatest strengths to doing this kind of filmmaking. I also really love the journey of the um, the first letter yeah, in, in the opening. into the editorial room. Where we basically follow the letter's journey from location to location with just great jazzy, upbeat music playing. And it's, it was a, I think that Lord of War, yeah, they did the same thing with the bullet. Similar, yeah, yeah the factory same, making of the bullet. Yeah, then, all the way into getting into the AK-47 of uh, a, of a person, of a soldier. I really like the letter sequence and it's it's really fantastic way to open the film. And it's not the opening, it's after the murder, but still to set up the world. It's just really brilliant. And because Fincher's usually someone who loves title credit sequences in this film in particular, it opens with the murder. So it actually changes the what he likes to usually do. I think he still gets the title credits in there somehow. Yeah, he loves that shit. It's really cool because yeah. he's such a visual visionary. And the digital filmmaking, which I want to talk to about in a little bit, is so tremendous. But I want to stay on the story and the script. Um this film is centered around two periods of the Zodiac's active files and cases and murders where it's the late 1960s, which is basically the first half of the film. His rise, his first killings, really, rise. and then discovering the letters being sent to the newspapers. And then the 1970s, later on, where, you know, that first period, there's intense public interest in the Zodiac and who the Zodiac killer is, whether it's just citizens or or uh, law enforcement investigators, journalists, and then the 1970s, no one really gives a crap about the Zodiac anymore, except for a couple of people, like Robert Graysmith still gives a crap, and it's, it's his obsession is trying to figure out who the Zodiac is. Toski is still obsessed with the Zodiac because he's still technically on the case, but then he has a situation where he gets kicked off the case because of his relationship with Robert Graysmith, as well as people believe that he wrote one of those Zodiac letters. And also, there are a couple references to Dirty Harry in this film because Dirty Harry was a lot of that story is based off the Zodiac Killer. And it's really kind of a very meta thing to have the character of Toski go to the movie screening at a movie theater of Dirty Harry because Dirty Harry's character was loosely based off Detective Toski in real life. So I thought that was a fun thing that Fincher did, emphasizing Dirty Harry. But also, he says, Toski says to Robert Graysmith, be careful with Dirty Harry. So I, I think there are a couple Careful of great there, references, yeah. references also, well, to it. Fincher, he actually, the reason why he put that in was because he saw Dirty Harry as a kid and hated the depiction of essentially Zodiac in that film as just being like a bumbling criminal. Mm-hmm. Not like bumbling, but like uh, he didn't have any of the mystery or the mythos or legend status that real Zodiac had. 
in the mystery and they just turned him into kind of like a normal kind of criminal. And so Fincher, even as a teenager, hated the depiction of the Zodiac. In in Dirt, Dirty Harry, he's not called Zodiac. He's called fucking, what's the other? Some other. The, uh, it's Perseus. No, I'm not kidding. <laughs> it's one of, the, one of the other horoscopes. And he, uh, he, he really hated the depiction of Zodiac. So that's why he put it in, the, in this film. And the thing with, Z- with Dirty Harry is... The public kind of got closure fictionally mm-hmm. from a movie of oh yeah, they, they caught away. Zodiac and uh, case is closed like no one cares about Zodiac anymore. So publicly they kind of got closure from a fictional film based loosely off the murders of the Zodiac Scorpio Scorpio that's Scorpio. what it was. But the, the obviously the case was still open and under investigation. So I think you know the the connection to the constant zeitgeist of the culture is really important to this story. And I just love like the references to Dirty Harry. And, yeah. One of my favorite aspects to the film is the ciphers, and that's what was so intriguing about Zodiac, and what really captured the public's attention was not just the letters, which were also really appealing to the to the story, but also these ciphers that people obsessed over, and obviously Grace Smith obsesses over them, being a person who already loves puzzles and things like uh, word problems. And then also I love how there's just this random couple of teachers and they solve that first cipher even though every authoritative law enforcement institution took a crack at it. Just two average citizens ended up solving the first cipher. But the codes are instrumental to, to Zodiac and Zodiac's mindset and Zodiac's love for teasing law enforcement, for tormenting law enforcement to having fun at their expense, making these puzzles that ultimately ended up just being most of the time just notes about his own ideas and personal opinions on things. And and taking credit for other murders. Taking credit for other murders, but not really divulging anything that he teased they would. Like, remember, the first one he said, the the second cipher, the first cipher he said it would reveal his name, but it didn't. And he just, time and time again, was just playing with the law enforcement. But the ciphers are really well photographed in this film. Uh, one of my favorite sequences is this quick montage of some analysts taking photographs of the first cipher. And we get a lot of great insert shots. Fincher, I know Wes Anderson gets so much love for his insert shots because they are, you know, so much fun. They're always completely overhead and they're just goofy sometimes. They're very silly. And the AI creation of so many movies in the style of Wes Anderson right now is so popular yeah, yeah. and fun. But Fincher is also a master at insert shots. All of his films. He's, I don't think he gets enough credit for them. I think Wes gets all the attention for his insert shots. Well, and Tarantino and Scorsese Tar- as well. Yeah, they do too. But still, Wes Anderson gets most of the attention for them. But Fincher, I don't really see people talking too much about his insert shots. But they really are... Really brilliant. Explain an insert shot to somebody. So an insert shot is if I'm looking, if a character picks up a piece of paper and then the director cuts to basically just an isolated image of whatever they're looking at. Pretty close up. Yeah, close up most of the time. Wes Anderson, his insert shots oftentimes are like overhead, you know, looking down at the letters or something that a character is holding. Something symmetrical. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) But Fincher uses insert shots very specifically they're only sprinkled about his films, but when he uses them, it's for a reason. And they're just really well done. A couple of my favorites were uh, in this film, The Zodiac Watch, when they're doing the interview with Arthur Lee Allen. And then Ruffalo's character, Ave, um, Toski, gets the watch. and he, So we see Ruffalo look at it with like this look. And then Fincher cuts to a close-up insert of the watch, and we see Zodiac with the symbol right there. And then the audience, it's like the audience is looking at the watch. You know what I mean? So the way he uses insert shots is really underrated, uh, fantastic. All the ciphers, the Zodiac letters, um, the film strip is a really great one. Robert sketches, you see a bunch of them as insert shots. And But I think the, the best one, it's like a montage of insert shots of the photographing of the first cipher. Two things I really adore about this script and the, the filmmaking in general are, number one is this long mystery of who done it, who's the Zodiac, all different avenues of trying to figure out who they are, all these links, these connections. Is Linda involved? Does they Do they know Linda? Is it this other guy? Is it them? And at the end of the day, multiple times in the film, the, the, the way you catch the Zodiac killer is told to us in the audience and to the characters. 
fingerprints, and handwriting. That's how you solve the Zodiac case. But Gray Smith is looking at other avenues. Towski is looking at other avenues. They're trying to get around that. But really, at the end of the day, that's how you solve the Zodiac killer. Without those two things, you cannot arrest somebody for the Zodiac killings in terms of without having physical evidence. So you need to be able to match handwriting and maybe get a fingerprint as well. Yeah, so I, I, I suppose that, you know, Zodiac, which w- what made him a master criminal was he probably purposefully altered his handwriting to make it so that it could not be recognizable. And also... And they bring that up in, this, in the movie. Yeah. Is he ambidextrous? Did he train himself to write differently? But then also a psychologist says... They say a psychologist will testify saying that uh, the creation of a new persona can change someone's handwriting. But again, it's still... It's yeah. subjective science and in also, a lot of yeah. ways. And also, was that fingerprint just planted there for Zodiac to fool the, the police to throw him off this scent? You know what I mean? So I think that Zodiac did things in the crimes that would make it impossible for any of for for him if he was ended up becoming a suspect to be convicted of a crime at all so that was the mastery he had in terms of the crimes he carried out and which is why he never got caught because no matter how many circumstantial things made someone like arthur lee allen the number one uh, culprit suspect i mean they could never prove it and was he the killer maybe maybe not but on paper definitely not but then in your gut kind of feels like he's the killer but there's no way to ever prove it true passage of time is really important to this storytelling for a a film like this especially when you were traversing two decades and so many filmmakers are really creative about how they pass time i think edgar wright is a really exciting director in terms of like whether it's a short period of time a long period of time he does really interesting sequences of of someone passing an hour and i think it's super fun and exciting and david fincher i think is a master at passing time in his movies in terms of transitioning through long t- time periods. And he does it multiple ways in this film in combination with the screenplay. One of the one of the best ways to do it in this film they do it is with birthdays between Toski and Armstrong. Um, Ar- he Toski points out that it's Armstrong's birthday two times, which means that, you know, we're going through multiple years of this case already, and this is taking a lot of time. The graying of characters here is the deter- hair of Toski especially, Paul Avery's hair. Both their hair are gray and whitish at the end of the film. The deterioration of health of Paul Avery, he is a mess at the end of the film, and he dies. He's on an oxygen tank. His skin is more wrinkled than it was before. In the opening of the film in the 1960s, he's a rock star. His hair is still dark and black, and he's very vibrant, but he just slowly deteriorates over time into alcoholism, into drugs, into seclusion on his boat. Another great transition of a passage of time is the building of a skyscraper. This shows that several months, if not a year or two, have passed while this massive skyscraper, this tower in San Francisco, was constructed. And Fincher just does a time lapse going up this skyscraper as it's built to show a massive passage of time. It takes about 10 seconds, but the audience knows, holy crap, a lot of time has passed. Another way that they do this is obviously the growth of Robert's family. He's married to Melanie now. He's got a couple other kids and a baby, showing that many years have passed in their relationship and in their marriage. There's a great fade to black that lasts several seconds, and then we get the text of four years later. And for me, whenever I watch this film, this very prolonged cut to black and fade It's really a gut punch when you see that it's been four years because you think we're cooking, we're getting on the investigation, we're on a lead, and then slow fade to black, four or five seconds. Four years later, you're like, oh my God, four years have passed and nothing has changed. A great way and unique way to show another passage of time. And music is really important and used very creatively by Fincher in this film to show more passages of times. Like you brought up earlier, there's a sequence with jazz. Now, he has a couple different genres of music in this film. He transitions from jazz and kind of classical at some times to then he's going into R&B and more poppy music. And then we're in the psychedelic rock. So he's going through pop music stages with the, using the music to show the passage of time. This film also showcased the instrumental part that the Zodiac case played on the cooperation between law enforcement agencies and jurisdictions. And so you could argue that the case may have possibly been solved or if not solved, been much more clear if these different jurisdictions were cooperating and sharing evidence. There's multiple sequences in this film where... Different officers, detectives 
are on the phone with each other and they're kind of like making deals for evidence. Like Vallejo has this evidence. We'll give it to you if you like scratch our backs, we'll scratch yours. We don't have a fax machine yet. Exactly. <laughs> and there was zero cooperation between dur- jurisdictions in this case. And the Zodiac case was actually a big part in changing that dynamic between law enforcement agencies to work together on cases rather it being, you know, Vallejo has their case and they have their evidence. And then the San Francisco detectives didn't even know most of the evidence that they uh, found on those cases. And then it was Robert Graysmith was the one who put everything together. And that's why he got so close because he gathered every piece of evidence. And there were a couple of times where, where Toski learned something from Graysmith where he was like, are you kidding me? I didn't, I didn't know that. And it was during his investigation and it's information that would have been vital and so helpful to his process and vice versa. And so one of the reasons Zodiac really eluded authorities was because all the evidence was never put together until many years after the fact. And so all these cops from different areas were chasing these crimes, not having the full puzzle together. They had pieces of each of the puzzle and none of them had it all in one sitting in one area. And so I love how the film Fincher and the screenwriter portrayed that really perfectly in this film, the confusion, uh, the misunderstanding of evidence and learning about evidence many years late and having absolutely no communication between departments whatsoever. And it was just, you know, this is pre-internet. This is pre-technology. You know, people are doing what they can to gather information. But I think that's one of my favorite aspects to this film, what really sets it apart from other investigative films. It's a great point. Something about serial killers, too, that people just can't get enough of. You ever seen that meme where it's like my girlfriend when she watches a horror movie and she's like terrified and then it cuts to a shot. My girlfriend when she watches a four-part miniseries on a real-life serial killer and she's just like relaxed and yeah, having just the time like, of her life. Yeah, <laughs> I've seen that, yeah. Something about or a murder podcast. Yeah, something about serial killers. The zeitgeist, our culture is obsessed and it seems like the obsession only keeps growing and growing, which is why I think this movie has aged so well and it's really timeless because people are still obsessed with serial killers. And, you know, Fincher has now made how many projects about serial killers? So we have Seven, Seven. Mindhunter, Zodiac, as well as um, Dragon Tattoo. Dragon Tattoo, serial killers. So at least four projects yeah. that he's involved, that he's directed or created that mm-hmm. involve serial killers. He's got Benjamin a- Button was a serial killer. <laughs> <laughs> so now he's got this like knack or connection to serial killers, and he's got a, a way of telling stories about them that are really that's really fascinating and effective for an audience because he doesn't like go over the line of what he shows, but this movie probably has some of the most disturbing sequences of killing that he's ever had in this film. Even though Seven has very disturbing sequences that we don't even see of killing besides the ending of that film, What's in the Box. That's really, I think that's the only time we actually see someone, in the get, box. see someone get killed in that movie, which is about serial killings. We see very disturbing sequences, but this movie has disturbing sequences of murders. And Mindhunter was really similar to that, but we never got really to the conclusion of a lot of those events of the killers they're portraying. But the, the serial killing scenes in this movie are terrifying. And, I mean, we have the opening July 4th murder of that couple out on a date. We also have the lakeside stabbing, which is really tough to watch. That stabbing sequence is terrifying. We have the taxi driver who gets shot in the head. We also have the woman in the car who almost was a victim of the Zodiac. So these these encounters of victims with the Zodiac are truly disturbing. But... The thing is, you see so many more graphic things on horror movies every year, but there's something about the tone that he creates with them and the realism he brings to you as an audience member of what would it actually be like if you were with the Zodiac, if he actually was chose you as a victim. I also think that it's the way he frames his images. So I would say the, the lake killing is by far the most disturbing, and even to this day, it's a, sh- it's a shot that... Two shots that really they still get under my skin no matter how many times I see it. It's uh, the, the shot of the man getting stabbed in the back multiple times. Oh, you see by his arms going up and down, yeah. And then the woman, she's getting stabbed, and as she's rolling over, he keeps stabbing into her abdomen. And 
there's the way he frames it. It's just a, a, a static camera, uh, medium wide, and there's nothing really that kinetic about it. But it's really how he decides to shoot it is what I think makes it so disturbing. And just those two shots, still to this day, I think it's I think it's how long he lingers on the shots too. He doesn't. He's just it's just two shots, and they you get about a five to six second shot of the guy getting stabbed, and then a several second shot of her getting stabbed and turning over. And I think not cutting away and not moving the camera is what makes it so disturbing because it's kind of just like we're used to so many cuts, we're used to so many different angles, and especially very long lenses. And then when something's very when most of the frame is very much out of focus and you're focusing on a subject with a very small depth of field, it kind of takes away uh, any kind of realism and it creates more of like the film illusion. But also, uh, he does a great job portraying blood in this film and now all of the blood you see in this movie was actually visual effects, even the blood on clothing. And he decided to do this because he didn't want to keep doing take after take while waiting to redress actors, while waiting to clean scenes. So all of the blood you see in the movie is uh, actually visual effects. And there's quite a lot of visual effects shots in this film. It's the early days of Fincher using heavy green screen, heavy visual effects. Obviously, all of the panoramics and cityscape shots are all visual effects because it is 40 years prior to the filming of the movie. But there are really... Incredible subtle pieces of visual effects artistry in this film. My favorite is the cab driver car uh, crime scene. Toski and Armstrong, when they come to that city square, that uh, intersection, that block, that is actually on a soundstage. And it's all blue screens around them. They built the streets and the street lights and the cars are there. But otherwise, it's all blue screens around the actors. Fincher CGI'd that entire set. He also CGI'd the overhead cab shot, which looks fantastic. The construction of the skyscraper, the shot of the Golden Gate Bridge looking down with the fog, uh, as well as even the bloody fingerprint on the cab driver's seat. These are all visual effects shots. And what sets, separates Fincher apart from other filmmakers is when you watch his movies, you don't even know that he uses CGI until you're told or you watch behind the scenes footage of it all, which is really impressive. And also, who is the Zodiac? I still think it's Arthur Lee Allen. He just fits like a glove to all the evidence <laughs> as well as that first interview. All the creepy, incriminating things he says, his RV, but all of his things uh, without the physical evidence is just all circumstantial. But the Darlene relationship, living 50 yards from yeah, her. Yeah, so I think that he was the Zodiac. They just never could actually officially But how can it. you explain the crew cut if he's bald? Uh, different conflicting evidence, you know what yeah. I mean? But also, what I think... The film does a great job of is just putting you in the paranoia state that Robert Graysmith was in at the time because, you know, the sequence where he's investigating who Rick Marshall is, this projectionist who is also a Navy man, a code breaker, and then connecting him to the dots of the posters, the movie posters, and then finding Bob Vaughn and going to Bob Vaughn's basement and that creepy ass scene where you're like, is this actually the Zodiac killer? I do the posters myself. It's my handwriting. And the handwriting is the closest match they've had so far to the Zodiac's letters. I think that's a great way of showing and confusing the audience. Like, is this the Zodiac or what was the point of that scene? It's just, it puts you, the point of the scene is to put you in the shoes of Robert Graysmith that he's seeing Zodiac everywhere, er around every corner, on every suspect. Every person he's talking to, investigating with, he's seeing Zodiac. Could this be the Zodiac? And I think that sequence with Bob Vaughn is really important to that point, and it's terrifying because I bet you in real life, Bob Vaughn is probably just a really nice guy that just yeah. wanted to make boasters. He wanted to help. But from Robert Graysmith's perspective, it's like, oh my God, his, his handwriting is so close. It's definitely the scariest part of the film, and not only the just the basement, but when he gets to the door and he can't open the front door, and then Bob Vaughn just shows up behind him, and, and Jill Hall like jumps in fear. And he just reaches to unlock the key and he knows to unlock the, the door. Yeah, he knows the connection of the basements, and there's not many basements in California. Yeah, it's it's so well shot. It's really fantastic. But that's just great character and great screenwriting and great directing of just like putting yourself, putting the audience in the shoes of Graysmith. That's you, the whole point of that. With Graysmith, you you can see the obsessive nature he has immediately because during the first cipher and letter reading in the editorial room. He is fascinated by what's happening and to the point where he keeps being told to finish the cartoon, finish finish the cartoon. 
and he, he just can't even seem to pull himself away from this cipher. And he immediately starts sketching out his own symbols to copy the, the cipher and trying to make the code. And that translates to over years, he just becomes so obsessive with it. And in a way, you, I would say, I mean, the detectives, they aren't so much obsessive as they, it's their job. It's Toski and Armstrong's job. Toski, you could say, beca- does become a little obsessive with it. I would say he's just more, he's yeah. an overly detailed detective. Yeah. And in a way, he wants it to be done with. Yeah. And it gets to the point where he's just, it's become a burden on his life. Everything's become a burden. Whereas with Graysmith, he can't seem to go back to having a normal life until he figures out this problem. It's the it's it's an insolvable problem in a lot of ways, and yet he commits everything to it. His his free time, his life, he he uh, sacrifices his family for it, and ultimately, that's I think the main theme of the film is obsession, obsession with the Zodiac, not just from Robert Graysmith, but we also see the the obsession of the public about Zodiac, especially in that area. But we get so many news stories. I get so many radio calls or radio stations talking about Zodiac, and Zodiac was on everybody's mind for a very long time, and it wasn't just the obsession of these handful of people. It was the obsession of an entire country at one point, and then very much so an entire city obsessing over this figure. And Toski even says to Graysmith, he's like, you know how many people were murdered last year? 200 people were murdered last year just in this city. And so it, it's an interesting point where it's like, why are we obsessing over... One person who m- probably killed maybe just four or five people might be lying about the other killings. Why should we put all of our resources into just that one thing and as opposed to trying to solve these other murder investigations? And I, so, I suppose the point of obsession comes to the fact that, you know, if there's a murder investigation of like a shootout or, or like a drive-by or like um, a, a simple murder, you know, that's pretty... It, 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 the public doesn't feel like they're in danger, especially if it's like, if it's not what's serial. So when it becomes a serial killing, and when a serial killer is out there on the loose, that means that anybody is at risk. Every everybody and anybody is at risk of falling victim to a serial killer. So I think that's why how it's different in terms of how the public views a murder. If this if it's a serial killer, it's like everywhere you turn. Maybe the serial killer's here. Maybe the serial killer's on that street. Maybe that's the serial killer. So I think that the film does a terrific job illustrating that fear that the entire city had. And because he's outsmarting the police and so clever about the way he committed his murders and just the toying with the public, toying with the police, that adds so much and feeds into the myth of the Zodiac Killer, the real-life boogeyman, who at the time people were obsessed with finding out who it was. Mm Mm-hmm. Did you did you notice the part where Paul Avery does coke right in front of Yeah, yeah, right when they're when they're having the blue the aqua velvet drinks. <laughs> yeah, that's great. I love that. Well this movie has great moments of humor too, like yeah. the aqua velvet when he tells him that it's not alcoholic. It's you wouldn't super, make fun of it if you tried it. <laughs> it's super funny. <laughs> I just love he just like they're just talking, but but uh Graysmith starts like you said, Boy Scout. He doesn't even notice that Avery's doing coke right in front of him. Probably doesn't even know what it is. Yeah, it's <laughs> so funny. It's so goddamn funny. I love it. <laughs> And they have a great chemistry. They actually, not real quick, they didn't even they didn't have a relationship in real life. Really, Gray Smith and Avery, even though they worked at the paper, I believe they worked at the paper together, but they weren't friends. Interesting, interesting. But what Fincher does in this film is, and he does it in a lot of his films. He's a big fan of using the two shot, and the two shot frame is, uh, you know, one a setup with two characters in the frame together. That's called the two shot. The other setups, are, it would just be like if you're doing, you know. A shot of one person and then a shot of another person. That's called shot reverse shot. And they edit from one shot to the reverse back and forth. Fincher is a big fan of the two shot in all of his movies, especially in this film. You see so many two shot setups. This is kind of like old school kind of filmmaking. The reason why most filmmakers like to do shot reverse shot is because they can edit between the actors to find the best moments of the performance. You really are beholden to the two actors in a two shot for them to do both do a great job in one take each time as opposed to, you know, you have the flexibility to cut away to a, like a better part from take three and cut, a, and cut it next to take six of the other guy or woman. And so 
this film is just littered with so many two shots. Most notably, it's a lot of Paul and Robert. Tons of two shots of them, as well as many other characters. I'm a really big fan of it because when actors can share the screen, especially for you know a take that maybe is 40 seconds or even a minute long, it really makes you feel like you've connected to them as opposed to them always being different camera shots. I'm a big fan of the two shot. Well, it's funny you bring that up because ah. David Fincher is a, a hybrid filmmaker when it comes to the two shot. He loves to do oh the two God, shots yes. so much because he actually will use different takes from the exact same shot. And what he just does is he puts the other, he cuts half of the frame off and puts the uh, shot from somewhere else. So if, like you said, we have a two shot of maybe Avery's on the right side of the screen and Grace Smith's on the left side of the screen. And there's a ton of space in between them. What he'll do is maybe if he like take five of Graysmith and like take seventeen of Avery, he'll just put them there together or splice different moments from different takes. And so it's camera, one frame, two shots. The camera's yeah. not moving, so you can literally cut out and take a different shot, a different take, and pop pop it in there for a specific reaction to a specific line. So that's why he also loves the two shots. I shot. forgot about that. Yeah, man. That's great. It's all over all yeah. his movies, man. Absolutely. He did it a lot in social network, especially with the uh, Rooney Mara scene in the opening but yeah you're right i totally forgot about that he does it a lot in this film he said it's pretty clever stuff it's great because like i said earlier you come into the problem of you know you if you don't do shot reverse shot you know if an actor messes up during the two shot you gotta basically do it again until they both do a good job all the way through you're putting yourself at risk if you're not doing more coverage so that's that's such a smart way to do it man what a, what a smart guy efficient guy man i totally forgot about that we made a. I totally forgot to bring it up. We made a TikTok clip about that like three years ago, and it went viral. I remember some people didn't believe it. I know, right? Yeah, yeah. But we, I found footage. I remember I found footage of from Fight Club. Of being, I mean, no, of, from Seven. From and from Social Network. Yeah, and from this, um, there was uh, some footage of behind the scenes of him of the edits and what they look like before and after the fact, and Mindhunter as well. He did it in Mindhunter a lot. So, uh, looks like we're gonna have to make a new TikTok. It's clip. pretty cool. Yeah. No one would know. He, that's the thing with him. He's that's why I call him a visionary visual effects director, basically, or, or a visual visionary with great vision. Visual visionary because he just thinks of things differently, and the way he goes about his process of doing things creatively is unique to him, unique to David Fincher only. And I think he's just a terrific filmmaker, and, and we're huge fans of this guy. He's a cool dude. He's a cool dude. <laughs> But man, I, I just, I'm just so, so shocked at the 7.7 .7 rating. What is it on Letterboxd? Let me see. I think it's a 4.0, which is disappointing. What, what would you give it out of 5 if you were going to rate it? I gave it a 5 out of 5 on uh -huh. Letterboxd. 5 out of 5? Yeah. I would give it a 4.5 out of 5. It has a 4. Yeah. I give it a 4.5. So you hate it. I hate it so much. <laughs> 10 or bust, baby. 10 or not. 10, 10 or 1. 10 or bust. <laughs> no, I give it a 9. Uh, because, you know, when I go through his career, I, I would give a 5 to... Fight Club, I would give a five to Social Network, and I would give a five to seven. But I think like this is a four point five for me because I think it's not quite for me a ten like those films are. I see, I see. You know what I mean? I and like Gone Girl, I, I adore. I give that like a four point five. Yeah, yeah. It's not. I wouldn't give Gone Girl a five. His average rating for me is really high though. Oh yeah, it's wicked high. He's always hitting it out of the park, player. <laughs> <laughs> he has a lot in the IMDb uh, top two fifty. He is a bunch a legend. of films. Yeah, a legend. You got anything else on Zodiac? I mean, I'm just I just love this movie. I've seen it many times, and I feel like I don't know. People complain about movies like this being too long, but then they'll watch a miniseries, no problem, and binge it. It's only two hours and thirty seven. Yeah, minutes. it's not that long. I think that it's a little overhyped. It's it's length. It's and it actually, I watched it the other night, and it flew by. It absolutely flew by, and I was just enthralled the whole time. So yeah, but you could watch a five-hour movie and you'd be like, "Oh, that flew by." I, I flew do. By. I do. Yeah. <laughs> Seven Samurai flew by. That <laughs> felt like what an was hour. It, Ninety minutes? Oh, three and a half hours. <laughs> 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 um, but I think that this movie's really instrumental for all of these actors' careers because this was before Ruffalo joined the Avengers. This was before Downey joined the Avengers. <laughs> well, before he was Iron Man. Yeah. Before. Yeah. Um, and that's what I mean by that. Yeah. Yeah. And then this is before Jill and Hall. I think really became a huge leading actor 
you know, he was still up and coming, I think, at a point. He po- was still the kid from Donnie Darko for a while. Yeah, I think so. You know, he didn't get Spider-Man, and yeah. he was in some... He's obviously a great actor. Mm-hmm. He's in The Good Girl in 2002. But, I mean, he he's Jake Gyllenhaal now. The guy is a freaking legend. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, I think that in all of their careers, this is a huge stepping stone for each one of them. I think so, too. Because it's aged so well. It and has. even though it didn't get great critical acclaim when it came out, people freaking love this movie and respect it more and more every year. And um, I'm sorry, I'm just going to Google an IMDb date real quick before what I... What kind of date are you Googling, <laughs> man? <laughs> I'm looking at what year Memories of Murder came out. I think 2005. it was 04, 04 or 05. 2005. 2003. 2003? Stop acting so confident. Whoa. That's false confidence. <laughs> <laughs> but Bong Joon-ho has said that Zodiac is one of his favorite movies. That's cool. Yeah. He said it's a masterpiece. I like that. Makes sense, but... You can see, I'm sure they use Memories of Murder as inspiration. I think the color tone for sure. I mean, obviously and also Fincher, the, the yeah, yeah the, the structure for sure. Because Fincher loves that, you know, that cool yellow tone, the aesthetic in a lot of his films. Well, I mean, he's had that since yeah. fucking Fight Club, man, in Seven. Yeah, kid. So, <laughs> Memories of Murder is more, uh, I feel like this got more of a green desaturated tone than yellow. Well, a lot of the sequences are just like kind of like take place outdoors around sunset and lots of wheat. So that's probably why so I, that's why I think of that like color from that. You're out of your mind. You're out of your mind. Also, the the cops in this movie aren't complete bozos. <laughs> <laughs> if you haven't seen Memories of Murder uh, and you're get, if you want to get into South Korean cinema, it's definitely a, a great film to watch. Absolutely. All right. That wraps our episode on David Fincher's Zodiac. I'm sure you love this movie as much as we do, and I hope you learned something new and got a different perspective of it from listening to our breakdown of this incredible movie from 2007. A modern classic. Modern classic called The 12th Greatest Film of the 21st Century by the BBC in 2016. It's high claim. It's probably top 20 now, somewhere around there. But thank you so much for tuning in. Become a patron today at patreon.com slash Raiders of the Lost Podcast. It is the very best way to support our show. And we appreciate you all around the world. See you next time. This episode was executive produced by our chosen one patrons, Cody Moen, Andrew Hagen, Becca Keen, Benjamin Cook, Calvin Murphy Griggs, Nicholas Martin, Darian, Tyler McFly, and Sal Koching. Our chosen one patrons are our biggest supporters. Thank you so much. Thank you for watching Raiders of the Lost Podcast. Be sure to hit that subscribe button, hit the like button as well, notifications for sure. Listen to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, everywhere you can listen to podcasts. And be sure to check out this other content we have on our YouTube channel.